chosen apostles, Peter and Paul. By the witness may we come to understand your hidden mysteries and keep your life-giving commandments, that we may be made worthy to share in their happiness. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever.
ask you to raise in your own hands the fragrance of this incense which we have offered, that it may be a sweet fragrance and a pleasing sacrifice. Through your intercession, may God forgive our sins and favorably remember all the children of the Holy Church, now and forever. Who is led to sin? I am not indignant. 
If I must boast, I will boast of things that show my weakness. Praise be to God
person, John the Baptist. And he stayed with him during the preaching of penance. When Andrew then was pointed out who the Messiah was at the baptism of our Lord, Andrew returned home. Now his father, his brother, Simon, had continued in their fishing. And the young, zealous Andrew came back and told Simon that he found the Christ. Now we know a lot about Simon's character through the Gospels. So we can imagine very easily that Simon kind of poo-pooed this sort of coming of his young brother. But he says, you must come and see the Messiah, you must meet him. When Simon is approaching our Lord, our Lord calls him by name Simon, but says, from now on your name will be Rock. Your name will be Kepha. Which we can, we can suppose that Simon only found more confusing. My zealous brother, he leaves, we're left with all the work, now he comes back. Not only is he zealous for religion, but he says he's found the Messiah himself. I go to meet this man and he calls me by this very strange name. This name comes back in this chapter on expectations, and as, I, as always, I encourage you to read the entire chapter 16 of St. Matthew. The beginning of it has the scribes and the Pharisees. They come to our Lord and they ask for a sign. They're asking for a sign, a natural sign. Give us some kind of miracle so that we can believe. There's a cynicism in this because there's two things happening. One, we're not going to believe unless you show us something outside. But of course, belief is not something that happens outside. Belief happens here, within us, the individual. And it's not easy, which is why most and many just wander away from the gospel as they grow old. Sometimes we come back, often we don't. But it's that internal aspect. So that's the first problem of the Pharisees. The reason why I call it cynicism is because these same men who are asking for a, a sign of wonder, a miracle, are the same men who have already seen our Lord healing the sick, giving sight to the blind. This is not the first day that our Lord has been in public. And that's why our Lord then tells them that it's a perverse and an adulterous generation. Adulterous. You don't just simply accept the grace of God. You need something here on earth. You need your miracle. You need a sign. You need things to be this way or that way in order for you to believe. And so he calls the generation perverse because you're making God jam into your own little categories. And it's adulterous because you're making it signs here below and things happening around in your life or else you don't believe it. You're merging together the world of grace and the supernatural and the natural. So our Lord calls it a perverse and an adulterous generation. And he said no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. But as Jonah preached repentance in Nineveh and spent three days in the belly of the whale, so also shall the Son of Man. That's the context then in which when they travel, they travel north to the place called Caesarea of Philippi. And that's our gospel today. So we've had the cynicism and the skepticism and this kind of religious expectation to some level, but also a preconception that this can't be the Messiah, this mockery. When they come to Caesarea of Philippi in the north, this is near the source of the Jordan. This is where the river begins in the mountains. And there is a large cliff area. It's known as Baniyas today. It had a sanctuary at the time of our Lord dedicated to the Greek, to the pagan god Pan. It was a god of nature. Because there's grottoes and there's water flowing. But on the top of this huge cliff, there is the new city of Caesarea Philippi. And so you have to understand the context that when our Lord starts speaking about building, this was a new city that had only been built in the last decades. Brand new, spotless, shiny, brand new city built of Caesarea. And when our Lord then, after having followed shortly before with the cynicism of the Pharisees and the scribes, 
He now has the apostles alone. They're at the base in this area of Banias, near Caesarea. And he says, so who do men say that I am? Very simple question. We've been doing this now for a year, two years. Who do they say the rabbi from Nazareth is? And the voices start piping up from the apostles. Some of them think you're John the Baptist come back from the dead. Some of them think you're Elijah. Elijah was always known to be the prophet who would return to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. Or one of the other prophets. And then our Lord says to the apostles, but who do you say that I am? And that's when Simon Rock answers immediately. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. This is a personal profession of faith on the part of Simon. He accepts the divinity of the man who stands in front of him. Not only as the fulfillment of all the prophets for the last 15 centuries, but also the fact that he is not only the promised one, but also the son of the living God, believing theologically in his divinity. And that's why our Lord's response is, blessed are you individually, blessed are thou, Simon, son of Jonah, in your person. For you are the rock, you are Peter, that name which I gave you two years ago, now you understand why I gave you this name. And upon this rock, this faith, this profession, I will build my church, my kahala, the religious assembly of the Old Testament now transformed into the body of Christ, the ecclesia, the church, and I build it upon this, upon you. And the gates of the netherworld, the gates of death, the gates of hell, as we say in general in English, meaning that limitedness of life, that limitedness here below, of death, of destruction, of sin, and of damnation, these will not have power against this assembly. And he says that he is blessed because it's not flesh and blood. You do not ask for signs again and again and again that things be in my way of expectation so that I can continue in my religion. And that's why he says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of your Jonah. Because flesh and blood, this world does not reveal this to you, but my heavenly Father. It is that grace of the belief, because of course remember that when the apostles looked at our Lord, they saw a man from Nazareth. There was no flash of lights around our Lord saying divinity. This is God. They saw a man, a man of extraordinary qualities, and who there were, were miracles around him, but it still required a profession of faith to believe. And that is what Simon is doing in this gospel today. So it's important to keep in the context of understanding the profound depth of what faith requires. It is a very dark path. There is not a lot of light that comes in. And as we enter into the light further and further into this light of God, it often becomes darker. Not because of the obscurity that somehow God is not communicating or speaking with us, but because the light is too great. The image which is classically used is if you took an owl and threw, them out and threw this owl out in the middle of the midday sun, the owl would be totally disoriented, completely out of its element, blinded by the sun of the noon. Not because the sun is bad, but because the owl's eyes are not capable of bringing in this much light. They're extraordinary in the middle of the darkness, but not in the middle of the light. Our little individual lives are made for God. But they are created in this world. We are flesh and we are blood. We are limited creatures. And as God pulls us as his children further and further into the light by his grace, it is inevitable that oftentimes we will flounder and we will be blinded by this light. But it is this profession of faith that we understand that has to be finally upon grace. Not because it's an expectation of what we have in our minds, but that we are open to where God is going to lead us and to bring us forward. 
And that is why to finish, the context which follows after today's gospel is our Lord immediately tells the apostles, so now we go to Jerusalem, where the Son of Man is going to be betrayed, handed over to the authorities, and put to death. But on the third day he will rise again from the dead. Expectations? Nobody in Israel expected the Messiah to be put to death in such a humiliating way. So the apostles don't hear the end of the prophecy. They don't hear the end that on the third day I will rise from the dead. This causes and sets up the entire confusion which will take place in the next six or seven months until our Lord's death and resurrection. Which is why when he is arrested, as we know so well, they all run. They have forgotten the promise of light and of redemption and of salvation and of a resurrection from the dead. They don't hear it because of their own limited expectations. So on this day of Saints Peter and Paul, we ask that these great apostles obtain for us the grace to be able to voluntarily and quite with great desire enter into the divine light so that God may freely lead us in our lives where He desires to lead us, not where we expect Him to lead us. And so that that goodness and that beauty and that truth that He desires to be in our lives be fully accomplished. May the prayers of St. Peter and Paul be with us always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Out of their love for you and for your holy name, shower your spiritual blessings upon them and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your kingdom. Especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, St. Joseph, her spouse, St. Mary, St. Jude, and St. Peter and Paul. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom the sacrifice is offered, for the repose of Khalil and Abu Sleiman and Frangia Padfush. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
church throughout the world. She is founded on your hope, remembers your salvation, and awaits your kingdom. We offer it for the bishops of the true faith. Grant them wisdom and knowledge that comes from you, and make them worthy to proclaim your kingdom. Especially Francis the Pope of Rome, the shot of Peter, our patriarch of Antioch, and Strong of Peter, our retired patriarch, and Gregory John, our bishop. May all the shepherds of the church sanctify their days by care and fear and justice for your people and that you have entrusted to them. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the priests and deacons here and everywhere who diligently serve in our village and over their flocks. May they receive their reward. Remember those who have taken vows of chastity and holiness, who keep their bodies and thoughts pure, that they may triumph in their efforts. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders who love you and all those who you wish to govern us. Strengthen and assist them so that we may live in peace under their leadership. Crown them with true faith and good works. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the children of the church redeemed by your passion and given life by your death. For they share in your resurrection those who are far and those who are near, those who are weak and those who are strong. Remember those who have presented these offerings upon your holy altar and accept them on your heavenly altar. Hear their trust requests in exchange for their earthly gifts. Grant the gifts of heaven. We pray to you, O Lord. have compassion on them. Remember especially those in distress or experience hardships, the poor, the weak, and the grieving, those in exile, captives and prisoners, the oppressed, outcasts and dejected, orphans and widows. Remember those bound by claims of chains of sin, subjected to various passions. Through your body and blood may their sins be forgiven and their faults be pardoned, their weaknesses be cured and their wounds be healed. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, in your great mercy, our Father and patriarchs, teachers of your holy church who are pleasing to you from the beginning. By the glorious light of their teachings, they brought people back from the darkness of ignorance to the true light of the Holy Gospel, and they fought to preserve the integrity of the true faith. Through their holy prayers, grant peace to your churches, monasteries, and convents, and put an end to war and strife throughout the world. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord. especially Mary, the Holy and Ever-Virgin Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and all who profess the Trinity in the true faith, through their holy prayers and petitions, look upon us with eyes of compassion, and may your calming and present face shine upon us, make us worthy to share in their reward and in their inheritance, and may their shadow be a shelter of protection for us on that fearful day of judgment. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, in the sweetness of your compassion, receive the souls of the brothers and sisters and children of baptism who have gone to you in the true faith from this world of darkness, especially those for those for whom the sacrifice is offered. May the mystery of your body and blood be pledged to life for them, the fire that consumes sins, and the burning coal that destroys transgressions. 
In your mercy, grant them rest in the dwellings of light and joy in the heavenly Jerusalem. O lover of all people, grant us life, abundant blessing and mercy, and the forgiveness of our sins and their
Thank you, O oh God, the Father of great mercy. We praise and glorify you for having made us worthy of your holy banquet and of sharing in your life-giving mysteries. We implore you, do not condemn us on that fearful day, but deliver us from shame and disgrace, that we may join the assembly of your saints, so that with them and among them we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. O oh Christ, King of glory, we entrust our lives to you, knowing that you will take care of our needs. Help the elderly with your mighty power. Restrain the young with your guidance. Nurture children and instruct them in your divine teaching. And sign each of us with your victorious cross. To you be glory with your Father and your Holy Spirit now and forever. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.